morning, guys. Welcome to History Maker's first financial webinar. I hope that you and your families are doing well and are keeping safe during these trying times and that you are sanitizing and putting your masks on. My name is Omule Momori and I am a third year accounting sciences student at VIT and I am the Vice Secretary of History Makers VIT and I will be your host for today. History Makers is a South African based organization founded in 2014 that aims to address South African challenges. It does this through it does this through providing financial education and skills development programs to the youth in the form of free weekly classes and regular seminars. Okay, now that you know a bit more about this amazing organization and me, let's just get right into it. But before I introduce our guest, I'd just like to go through how we'll go about the question and answer session, right? So if you guys have a question during the presentation, please, um, send it through the chat box at the bottom of your screen. I'm sure you guys can see it there. Yes, okay. So guys, today we have Kulufelo Mulewa from Stanlib who will be educating us about private debt as an asset class. Kulufelo holds an LLB and an MCOM in finance. With industry experience of 15 years, y'all better get your notepads and pens because we are in for a treat. Kulufelo looks after the developmental and infrastructure strategies within the Stanlib CA investment team. He has 15 years experience as both a debt and private equity financer, gained at Rand Merchant Bank, Safika Holdings, Inspired Evolution Advisors, and Infrasec. Kulufelo also has board experience, having sat on a number of boards, including business partners, audit and risk, investcom, co-chair nominations. Small Enterprise Finance Authority, Audit and Risk Personnel Committees, the Kelly Group LTM, Audit, Com Audit Committee, sorry, Children's Radio Foundation, Chairperson, and Rhodes Scholarship Trust, Oxford University Selection Committee Board. I will now hand over to our guest, Kulu Fellow. Thank you. Good, uh, good morning and Thank you, uh, Homolemo, for that introduction that probably made me look a lot shinier than I really am. Um, but thank you, and I'm quite excited to have this opportunity to speak to my fellow uh, Vitsis, because I'm also an alumni of, of Vits. Um, probably, uh, you know, a long time ago, not, not, not recently, but uh, probably so, you know, um, really enjoyed my time at WITS and uh, it's benefited me both personally and professionally. I'm going to ask you, Humulimo, if you can allow me to share the screen, because I've got a presentation that I'll, I'll walk through. And um, I think I'll keep it quite interactive, so please feel um, please feel free to, you know, to Q&A as, as we go on. Um, so could, could you please allow me just to share the screen and, and then I'll put up the presentation. Um, you, it's still, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thanks. I was just saying to Mukobe that uh, I'm actually a, a Zoom novice, so we usually use Team. So I had to practice how to how to share the screen before I jump on. So just give me a few seconds, and I'll be up and running. I've got it here, and uh, okay, hold on. Let's, oh, there we go. Can you see that? I hope I hope it, that can be seen. Um, okay, so as as mentioned, I'm I'm a PM at uh, Stanlib's private uh, credit alternatives business, rather. And as the name suggests, we look after 
what we term private, variously as private debt, but we look after credit assets. And we currently manage about 50 billion of, of assets at the moment. Um, it sounds like a large number, but if you put it in context with, uh, I guess, what's available out there, we, I mean, we're big, but we, the other sort of much bigger asset classes, if you, if you think about it, that, in that regard. But, you know, we've been doing this for 11 years as a business, and we, we started out and right at the advent of the global financial crisis. So for those who do know what the global financial crisis, just you'll excuse me if I give a broad synopsis, but basically in 2007, end of 2007, 2008, there was a, there was a, a, a crisis, which was the second largest financial crisis after the Great Depression of 1929. And the effect of it was essentially, it originated out of the US in the housing market. And I guess putting it simply, what happened was that uh, there was a lot of debt that was pumped into the market and this enabled people to buy houses and these people were not credit vetted and then what the banks did clever people within financial services generally uh, maybe clever in inverted commas what they did was that uh, they repackaged these debts and they, they just kept reselling them into the market and then what emerged was a credit bubble and a credit bubble as the name suggests means that there was a so there was a disconnect between house prices and the value of that credit and the whole thing came tumbling down like a, a pack of cards um, for our purposes it was right at the time of Bulugwani um, when we transitioned from Tabumbeki Tabumbeki's economy to what would later become Jacob Zuma's economy essentially and in a lot of ways, we still um, we still haven't recovered as a as a country. I mean, the rest of the world did to some degree before COVID. As a country, we haven't uh, recovered from pre GFC levels for sure. So what's interesting is that uh, now with this COVID crisis, we are reliving some of the I guess the horror. And in fact, in some ways, even more so that we lived within uh, the global financial crisis. So most working people before GFC would have told you, no, you know, in a 30 year, 20 year career, I've seen one major crisis. So for those of us who started working in the 2000s, this is our second, maybe two and a half crisis. And what's particular and I guess relevant to our discussion here is the role that credit has played. Um, when we speak of credit and private debt in a sense, we have to probably put it within a broader context. So when fund managers like ourselves wake up every day, they make financial decisions as to how to move money within the system. Now the system variously described includes things like the JSE, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, and things like maybe less so what you've heard about is the bond exchange, which is similar to the JSE, but it's for credit instruments primarily. But a lot of things happen outside of those two particular components. So when I speak of system, I speak of everything from your stock fell, uh, type accounts which have been regularized and which is huge. I think a lot of people don't appreciate how big that is. So we speak in billions there. Um, to people buying home loans, uh, buying houses through home loans, to people buying cars through um, financing packages, but even particular to people signing up for undergrad um, study and either taking out a study loan or applying through NIFSIS. 
And there's a whole back end as to how that's funded. And a lot of it has got debt as, as an underpin. So what happens, and I'll use a very um, hopefully relatable example. So for instance, if you guys graduate one day and then you decide, look, I want to go buy a house in Midrand, just for argument's sake. And that house, let's say that house costs 100,000. Um, there's no house, but just for the purposes of my example. And 10 of you decide that you're going to buy a house for 100,000. That's a million. And then you all apply to FNB, APSA, the rest of them. And then they give you a home loan for 100,000 each. And that's a million rands worth of home loans. So what happens is that the banks then own the home loan or the debt instruments. So you pay them every month. They know that you pay them. Let's say you pay them uh, 10 rands every month, just for argument's sake. They know that the 10 of you are paying them every month. You've got decent jobs and then you've got decent uh, chances of paying them back. So what they then do is that they take all the 10 rands that you pay them every month and then they package them essentially and that's an actual asset or a benefit in the bank's favor. And they can do with it what they want, essentially. Um, they can call guys like us to say, listen, we've got uh, a million rands worth of home loans. Why don't you guys invest in a vehicle that houses these home loans, essentially. And the benefit to guys like us is that we would get a steady income outside of that. Because we know these are good students, good jobs, good credit ratings, and they're likely to pay every month on time for the duration of the home loan. So we've got steady streams of income. And for the bank's benefit is that they don't hold the full value of the million. So they share that risk as well. So in that sharing of the risk, what happens is that uh, you start introducing new players into a asset class which would now return in private debt. So instead of just being the banks who would be the primary um, would be the primary players in this in this instance, you've got uh, institutional investors like ourselves lining up trying to get a piece of the pie. So the bank might not sell the full million, just to extend my example, they might sell say five hundred thousand of the million and then keep the rest of the five hundred thousand uh, essentially. And what that what that essentially means is that now portfolio managers, institutional investors like ourselves have got options now. So I don't necessarily have to wake up on Monday and then decide that I'm going to put all of my money into the JSE. I don't wake up thinking that all I've got is that I've got to go buy listed shares um, and that's how I'm gonna make a return. So I'm faced with a series of decisions as to where to allocate my money. And I want you to probably hang on to that word, allocate, because I'm going to come back to it. Uh, Cause it plays a very fundamental um, role in how we interact with the market essentially. But I've got choices essentially is what I'm saying. And choice one, if I've got a hundred rands, I can put maybe 50 rands into the JSE Hopefully it makes a return. I can put 30 rands into property. Hopefully it makes a return. And then I can put the balance of 20 into unlisted instruments, which could be private debt. So as mentioned earlier, my own journey is a mixture of finance and, and legal, which which has helped in how I've approached the career, my, I guess my chosen career. You know? So the legal part helps in the sense that uh, it underpins the way I approach uh, work. And, you know, I think for, if there are any of you who are training to be lawyers, what law does is that it really um, instills in you a, a very particular and very pedantic approach. But I didn't start there, but I actually started with a scholarship from KPMG to do computer science and maths. I don't know if they still offer uh, the degree in BE Consult, but that's where I began. And I mean, I knew nothing about computer science. I didn't like it. I did two years of it and I really wanted to be a lawyer. And so at some point I, I made the switch. But what's ironic is that I still owed um, 
KPMG money. And what happened is that I had a debt to KPMG. So KPMG had a debt, um, had a debt and where they were the creditor and I was the debtor essentially. So I owed them money. And in order to owe them, to pay them back, I needed to go back and work post my LLP and pay them off. So essentially that small interaction between me and KPMG speaks to a much broader market, uh, market interaction where there's a series of transactions within the system between people who grant credit and people who utilize that credit or whatever, whether it's studies or, or similar, et cetera. And the irony of it all is that I ended up being in uh, financial services anyway, and I've never practiced law in my, in my life, but no, no regrets there. Um, so, and I think the gist of that um, little analogy is to highlight how pervasive debt is in our lives. You know, as I said, it can be from stock fails to student loans, but to a much broader category of uh, financial inclusion. For the purposes of this chat and how we think about it within a credit alternative space is that we see private debt as a distinct and growing asset class. So many of you might have heard of the term private equity, for instance. And private equity is, as the name suggests, is really um, big, participate, big participants in the market who buy companies essentially, grow them at a value and then dispose of them. Um, and you know, what they do, they play quite a critical role in augmenting what we, most of us know to be equity like in the JSE, which is more listed equity. So it's not, it's not private. So listed equity being public because there's very onerous and specified reporting mechanisms which make it public in its nature whereas private equity is more uh, you know it's outside of that realm of scrutiny um, and you can look them up i think some of the largest private equity houses uh kkr i would suggest anybody go to watermila and look for a book called uh, barbarians at the gate i think there's a movie which speaks of private equity quite uh, quite nicely, gives a good exposition of what private equity emerged as an asset class in the US in the mid 80s. What's happened though, uh, as a lag, is that you started to see on the other side of the balance sheet, this idea of private debt establishing itself as a clear and identifiable asset class, which fund managers uh, come back to in making their allocation decisions. So, the components of that is that uh, private debt, like very much like private equity in the example that I gave, is typically understood. So it's not, uh, it's not a uh, sort of JSE or a bond exchange listed uh, role where you've got big um, reporting mechanisms. So it's, it's typically what we would term bilaterals or similar to bilaterals where we the party lending and then the party borrowing as a private entity uh, or a state entity. Or, but the nature of the agreement is between us, essentially. And it cuts across the, the spectrum. So it's not listed, it's not, uh, it's not on the JC as I, as I mentioned. Um, and, but it cuts across kind of multiple sectors. So, we participate in lending to corporates, and I'll give some examples of where a corporate would want. Uh, but the role of private debt is, has also facilitated infrastructure spend. So you would have seen in the news recently, there's a lot of discussion around post-COVID uh, recoveries. And a key part of post-COVID recoveries is going to center on infrastructure spend. And I think just some reading, if you've got time, is to reference to, there's a paper called the Business, uh, Big Business Working Group, which was released about two weeks ago, which speaks to a post-COVID uh, recovery and the center infrastructure spend as a key component there. 
And another one is actually the ANC's own economic transformation document, which specifies in quite a lot of detail how the ANC at least, and I guess by extension government, is thinking about um, economic recovery and how infrastructure plays a role. So the other strategies we look at obviously is, is retail, um, project-based and securitized notes and impact. And I'll touch on those various, not all of them necessarily, but the example that I gave of 10 of you taking up 100,000 Rand home loan, buying homes in mid-rent, and then the banks bringing guys like ourselves in for say half of that. That's effectively what a securitization um, system looks like as well. It's a, a form of financing that also arose in the States in the 80s where they would package loans. So uh, once again, on my examples, the banks say, listen, we've packaged these loans across 10 different individuals. Um, why don't you guys buy half of our position, essentially? So they on sell that position and then de-risk their position to 500,000. And that's essentially what a securitization is as well. Um, real estate self-explanatory. So private debt plays a critical role in financing real estate. And everything from student housing, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, all these uh, student housing um, initiatives that have mushroomed around Brownfontein, uh, Auckland Park, etc. Debt has played a very, very critical role in, in, in that space. And um, I guess bringing it maybe to a more granular level, the PIC, for instance, has uh, played quite a key role in some of the, in fact, a lot of the uh, student housing initiatives that you're seeing around Brownfontein. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that for a variety of reasons has been a big sector. But real estate also includes, so your normal things like shopping centers and uh, office, etc. And so debt plays quite a key role. And just as a quick aside there, um, on real estate, you've got uh, what they call listed real estate you've got is organized under a series of legislation and what they call REITs. Um, and you can maybe look that up. REITs speak to establishing property and real estate as, a, as its own asset class, much in the same way that I'm speaking about private debt as an asset class. Now corporates are probably, excuse me, along with the state, are probably the largest participants and takers up of uh, private debt. And you can see why, I mean, corporates have a variety of needs um, and there's a variety of reasons why they might want to access debt as opposed to utilizing um, cash that they've got on balance sheet as well. So for example, a mine looking to expand operations uh, might say, look, if we need a uh, thousand rands, we'll put in uh, 600 and then we'll borrow 400 from private debt participants or the, or the bond market or wherever, but they'll access the, they'll access that financing for the thousand rands in a, in a variety of ways. Which sort of brings me to, it's not really on the next slide, but I think just to touch on it essentially is Corporates, SOEs, uh, state-owned entities, um, any borrowing party essentially has at the back of their head what's the most optimal way in which they can maximize their operations. So it could be for expansion purposes, um, it could be for what we term working capital purposes, and what they do, so this mix between how much money they put in and how much they borrow, we usually refer to that as a capital structure. So different capital structures will suit different corporates' needs, uh, essentially. And in fact, the same corporate can have a different capital structure um, at, at any given time throughout its life. And, and you'll understand why. So let me put it this way, just maybe um, drawing it down to an individual. You've graduated once again, you want to buy a car, for 200,000 friends, the bank says, great, we can finance you, but we want you to put up 20,000 rands of the 200,000 rands, and we'll finance 180,000 
assets. So essentially there what you've got is that you've got your own personal capital structure. So you've got 20,000 in equity and then you've got 180,000 in, in debt. And together, the two of them make up the composite capital structure. So if you have more than 20,000, you might say, look, you know, cars depreciate, so it's better that I put up 100,000 and the bank finances is me 100,000. So each, and, uh, each individual will have uh, a different capital structure which suits their needs, etc. So with all of that said, uh, what we've seen is that uh, private debt, especially since the global financial crisis has cascaded. So what the GFC did is that it actually organized the thinking around private debt and the role in which private debt can play in terms of organizing the broader economy essentially. And by that I mean is that you, you had the large banks and large institutional players within the debt market. It wasn't really private debt per se, but it was unwieldy. Um, sorry, yeah, it, it was unwieldy, it was, it was large, and uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't organized, and there was a big gap, literally a big gap in terms of how corporates, governments wanted to finance themselves. And so what you see from about 2009, 2010, you start to see quite a large uptick in the role that private debt plays. I mean, these are all European, mainly European and North American uh, stats, but you can see it even within a South African context that uh, it correlates. So you start to see the role of private debt. Uh, so private debt being outside of your more listed credit stuff, which would be in your fixed income space, and the role of banks themselves um, kind of reducing or at least changing. You know? And you start getting institutional investors. Uh, so you see on this figure two here, this institutional investors, asset managers and insurers for a variety of reasons. Uh, private debt makes sense for insurers, starting to play quite a big role in facilitating the role of debt in uh, increasing the economy. Um, I don't know if there's questions because I can't see the chat, but please, if there are, I'm happy to pause and take, and take them as they roll in. So I'll take guidance from Kumule um, Mazar. Um, so what it means is that as it grows and as it becomes larger and I mean there's different opinions but in my own view is that uh, how you establish how something establishes itself as an asset class is that it has its own distinct um, characteristics and by characteristics, I mean that it's got its own distinct financial and economic characteristics. So you can map it, you know, whether technically by uh, running some sort of stochastic analysis on it um, to show some sort of differentiation between, say, private debt and real estate on the one hand, or private debt and listed equities on the other hand. You know. So you know, for instance, the JSE on average over the last 10 years has yielded a return of about between say 12 and 15% um, annually. There's some distortion in the last three years, but on, on average. And you know that listed equity kind of gives you a certain return expectation but that's one half of the analysis, if I'm, I'm oversimplifying it. The other half of the analysis is that uh, the JSC is also giving you um, quite a level of volatility. So, so, and that's its own characteristics, which I'll come back to. So you look for, okay, this gives me a return of X, and at the same time gives me kind of volatility and or risk of Y. And so you've got to look at both X and Y in essentially determining not only the characteristic of the asset class that's under consideration, but whether it makes sense for you in your portfolio and as an individual investor. 
So what happened is that you had private debt essentially as a niche um, offering by certain investors. So highly sophisticated investors would come into, uh, into the asset class and I consider ourselves as a standard credit alternatives as highly sophisticated in this asset class particular. So we'd come in, but what's happening is that you, you started to see, as I said, as it grows, you started to see um, other money following the, I guess, the so-called smart money, essentially. It's, it's regularizing as, a, as an asset class. And you started to see solutions which um, play to these characteristics that I was speaking about uh, and being matched with, even within a, a retail fund context, so not just institutional investors. So some of these characteristics that I spoke about, uh, which are idiosyncratic, is that uh, you can map with private debt, you know, that it's got uncorrelated uh, a return framework. So a pause on that. What that simply means is that, when I speak of it being distinguishable, is that you can clearly track analytically that private debt performs in a specific way from a return perspective and a risk and volatility perspective as well. And um, the example of the JC that I gave of like 10 to 12 percent, etc. You can put that in a box, but you can certainly put private debt in a box. And extending that further, you can take the two of them and then you can overlay them and compare and then determine, okay, this makes more sense for me because of X, Y, and Z, or this makes more sense for me because of A, B, and C. So, and the thing about private debt, uh, given the bilateral nature almost of the engagement, um, and by bilateral nature, I mean, it's usually a very contract specific uh, engagement. So an SOE comes to us or a corporate comes to us and says, listen, these are funding needs. We, we don't simply call a broker like I would with listed equities and then press a button and then funds flow essentially. I mean, I'm being simplistic, but here we would sit down, we would negotiate terms that would be specific to us, specific to them, hopefully meet each other in the in the middle. So what that allows us to do is that it allows us to tailor the risk profile of, um, it allows us to tailor the risk profile of the, oh, I lost my screen. It allows us to tailor the risk profile of the, of the offering, you know. So you could have, let's say two, very similar mining houses uh, coming to us. And because, I mean, let's say they both platinum producers, just for the sake of the example, same sector, um, maybe even similar in size and so on. They operate in the same places, but they could have very different financing needs. And going back to my capital structure, analogy, they could have very different capital structure profiles as well. So you can tailor it as well. The nice thing with debt as well is that, or private debt, is that what it does for a portfolio, and this is an important point because you know you don't consider asset class or asset allocation, which I said I'd come back to within a vacuum. So you consider it within your particular suite of needs as a, as an investor. So what do you want the outcome to be? Is it for retirement purposes? If you're an individual, is it to maximize your sales cycle if you're a corporate, uh, et cetera, you know, and the, and the line is long of consideration. But what it does is that it also, for a portfolio where I've got maybe equity, I've got property, property hasn't done well over the short cycle, um, and now there's equity on a risk-adjusted basis, mind you. And what I then say is that maybe I should add private debt into my overall portfolio. So I've got just equity, I've got um, real estate or property exposure, and now I've got private debt exposure. So on an overall basis, the three of those things have got different characteristics, as I mentioned, and they 
return or yield certain outcomes, different outcomes. So what private debt does, the benefit of it is that it, because it's predictable and we can show this stochastically as well over a, a short run and even a long sort of 10, 10 to 12 year run period, it's predictable. It's, you know, I know that I'm going to get um, payments every quarter or every half year. Um, the default rates relative to the payments are acceptable to us, etc. So what it does to a portfolio, especially in a time like this, is that it rebalances it to probably an acceptable level of, of outcomes, essentially. And that speaks to the third point, that um, the last point there on stable return profile, is that uh, private debt's characteristics, as I said, because it's contracted, cash flows, it's a contracted outcome, it's specified, the risks are tailored, the stability of the asset class is, you know, on a toe-to-toe, -to -toe, it's probably one of the more stable um, asset classes, especially within a South African context as well. So when I speak of stability, so return is easy, you know, so return, I think conceptually, even if you're not a finance student, you can conceptually get your head around that concept, you know, so I give you uh, some money, I say pay me back by, you know, a certain date, you give me my money plus interest, for instance, and that interest plus the capital that I get back, that's my, call it total return, you know, um, being simplistic, but I think we get the gist. So, you know, conceptually and intu intuitively, I think return is an easy concept for, for most people. Um, but as I mentioned, it's not the only thing that we, we worry about. And I would even go as far as saying is that from a credit house perspective, our first port of call is not necessarily the return, but we're very downside risk orientated. So when we speak of stable return profile, we want to show that there's not a lot of volatility. You know? And by volatility, just, this is just one metric. There's a lot of ways which are more technical than what I'm describing. But volatility is just to say that I, if I, for instance, I lend you a thousand rands and our agreement is that you're going to pay me five rands in interest payment every month, you know, I largely get that five rands every month, you know, and it's predictable as opposed to getting five rands today, tomorrow I get three rands, the next day I get seven rands, you know, and it keeps going up and down. So if you map it on a graph, so on a graph it's relatively stable as well. And the risk and downside, so the stability um, relationship, this risk adjusted return um, relationship that I'm referencing is highly dependent on where we are on the capital structure as well. So the capital structure, once again, I, with the car example, a bank gives you 100,000, you've got 20,000. The 20,000 is essentially your equity, but the bank's portion is the debt essentially, and the car is the asset that underpins the, the lending. So when you speak of capital structure, we've got debt, generally debt, and then we've got equity, generally equity. But within debt itself, you've got various subcomponents. Um, so senior debt, and as the name suggests, once again, would be quite high ranking debt. And a characteristic of that is essentially that senior debt is the most secured, right? So it's the one that if the proverbial hits a fan, something goes wrong, the senior debt guys are very relaxed. I mean, I'm, I'm probably oversimplifying that, but they're less stressed than the equity guys. So in the car example, once again, you lose your job, you can't pay back the car, the bank says, okay, fine, you can't pay back. They knock on your door, they take your car. And then they sell the car. Uh, sorry, um, um, there's a question. Okay. Um, okay, if Lisa is asking you for the link to the business group article. I'm guessing it's the one about COVID-19 impacts, the one that was released two weeks ago. Yes, yes, that one, yeah. And then Mukove is asking, what are the risks in lending to real estate or property during this pandemic? 
Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the first question, yeah, certainly it's the one that, uh, it's a COVID recovery one. So I think a, a quick Google search, but I'm happy to find it and then send it to Mugwabi to disseminate after this as well, because I, I have the actual report. Um, the second question, yeah, property. So when lockdown hit uh, four months ago, it property was, and here I guess I'm referencing both commercial and office space in particular, but there's a cascading effect across all property, even residential. That slowed down to almost zero. So there was no um, trading activity in places like Santa City, Eastgate, wherever else, Rosebank. And uh, we must bear in mind that the value of real estate is not just merely the brick and mortar that come with owning a property, but certainly the trading activity. In fact, that, that's probably a more accurate way. So the impact has been, has been massive. Um, and I think it's going to take a long time before that sector uh, normalizes. And what will be normal, I think, might not be what we were traditionally used to in the sense of people going to shopping centers um, in the way that they did. There's been an, a huge surge in um, online shopping. In fact, there was results um, out the other day across the spectrum. Uh, I mean, huge in South African terms. So there's been a near 40% increase in three months uh, with respect to online shopping. And it's not even three months because remember, the initial lockdown um, didn't allow e-commerce activity. So I would say in the last six weeks is where that 40% is coming out. And uh, as a last point, you know, South Africa has got a very different relationship to shopping centers than, say, the U.S. Uh, in the U.S., in South Africa, shopping centers, are, it's more than a shopping center. So there's a very real um, public um, space utility factor that's attached to them. So it's like going to a park, in other words, right? So it's not just simply people going to shop, etc. Because, because of the nature of the way that suburbs and the likes are, are designed, is that where people feel the most safe, uh, where they don't have to be in their houses, they don't necessarily go for walks in their neighborhoods per se, or go to a park, uh, whatever, but they go to a shopping center, they sit at Tasha's and so on as well. So there might be an argument that uh, that feature, which is really just my own opinion, but it's been made by others um, in, in different ways, that feature might at least uh, keep a residual factor of the way we, you know, people go into shopping centers. And people, uh, since lockdown has been reduced, have been going to back to the shopping centers. But, you know, things have changed dramatically. Uh, online is not going to decrease. It's only going to go up. And, uh, the reason why I made the contrast with the US is that even before COVID, you would see large retailers um, going bankrupt. You know, some of the largest, so Toys R Us um, is, a, is a good example where they just went bust because of the online um, e-commerce force that the likes of Amazon have unleashed in that space. Sorry, a long answer. Um, yeah, and I was just, I guess I was saying that, you know, there's a relationship between where you are in the capital structure and the returns. And I think it's an intuitive concept that I'm not going to stick too long on. Um, but obviously the more secured you are, the, the better positioned you are. And the less secured you are, the more at risk you are. And a key concept in finance is that you must get paid for risk. So the more secured you are, the less your return expectations should be. 
the less secure you are, the greater your return expectations should be. So for our purposes, we straddle this entire, um, at least from senior debt, as you can see on this thing, excuse me, and junior debt. So we straddle that entire uh, place where we often go into very senior secure positions and we look at, uh, at mezzanine and subordinated instruments as well. A key feature, and I'll just jump quickly here, is that I think the reason why when I speak of features of the asset class being distinguishable um, is that um, it has certain, I guess, mechanisms and even benefits that entrench it as a distinct asset class. Uh, and I think the key one is liquidity. So we usually speak of credit as being um, self-amortizing or self-liquidating. And that's really just a fancy way of saying that, uh, you know, unlike equity, where if I'm in private equity, I buy, say a bunch of you guys leave, it's, you set up a private equity fund, and then you decide that you're going to buy, um, take a lot, just for argument's sake, to extend and mix my metaphors. You put up cash and your equity is stuck in, in there. Um, the only way you're going to get your equity out is if you sell your investment. Um, and the same example can be utilized to my, to my car example. So the bank, for instance, gets it's cash back because you keep paying them back, right? Every month you pay the bank. And then the bank has a different and reducing balance as the years go on. Whereas the 20,000 that you put in, you can only get that 20,000 once you sell your car. So credit has got a self amortizing profile, which is, uh, which is very attractive for investors. I'm not going to touch on volatility because I've spoken about it um, for sure, but it, it is worth reiterating that it's a key feature that this thing trades within a very narrow band. Um, but of course, you know, I keep mentioning that it's not the only thing we look at return. Uh, so we speak of this concept in finance called the risk reward profile. And I touched on it in the previous slide is that obviously the higher the risk is, the more re reward you would want. The lower the risk is, the less reward you want. And reward is really quantified in terms of return. Um, so if I can use a crude example, if you go to a financial services regulated institution and you've got good credit and you take out a loan you're not going to pay the same as you pay if you had bad credit and you went to uh, i guess like a, a machonista you know who takes your id um so there's different relationships between the assessment of risk but a, a more particular point to all of that is that in private debt, and it's a feature of the asset class, uh, is that uh, there's asymmetric risks. Um, and we've got to consider that when we consider this relationship between risk and reward, as, as, as I've described it. And what it really means, if I like clean out the jargon and I kind of distill it to its components, what it means is for those of you who have some sense of stats, is that. Uh, with private debt, you don't see a normal distribution curve, um, but you'll see a distribution curve that kind of tilts either to the left or the right, depending. Um, and the reason is that you've got a, a finite number of upside scenarios for private debt because it's capped, you know, so you, you all the features I've described. So the lend you money. So with the car example, the bank will lend you money, and the best outcome for the bank is that you pay them back the value of the loan, the future value of the loan, essentially as well. Um, if for whatever reason your car now in, increased in value, the bank doesn't really get the benefit of that. You as the equity. Um, 20,000 rand provider gets the benefit of that. You know? So for instance, if your car improved in value, 
you would then be able to sell that car, pay down the bank, and then get more than 20,000 out of that. But with, with private debt, with debt in particular, you don't really have a scenario where you've got a, what we call an upside scenario um, built into it. It's not the norm, I mean, there are other scenarios. But what you do have is that you've got an infinite number of downside scenarios. So things can go wrong, which you don't even um, foresee, for instance. You know? So you can't even imagine them um, even at the start of the loan. So on the one hand, you've got capped upside, and on the other hand, you've got uncapped downside scenarios. And this is why we speak of it as being asymmetric risk. And if you plotted what, uh, for the stats people in the room, if you plotted, for instance, a metric like standard deviation, um, you would see, as I described the curve, it would be asymmetric. It wouldn't uh, be this bow curve, um, kind of mirror, mirror distribution curve that we, we're so used to seeing as well. So that's a, that's a very important feature, I think, when you're thinking about it. I'll stick very briefly to this one, is that uh, I think within a global context, um, all the stuff that I described around uh, comparing the features of the asset class to equity, bonds, cash, um, we, you can see here, as I, as I mentioned, that we can actually map the historical run on both, so it's just yeah, on both volatility and return and compare it to other asset classes. So I'll pick a few of these here. Um, if you look at the JSE, SA Equities um, top 40, it's been a horrible run in the short run. Um, annualized return of 0.73, right? So that's the one right at the top, um, right here at the top. And if you look at, compare that to credit, SA diversified credit here um, at the bottom, where you've got an annualized return of just under 10%, nine and a half percent. But the most interesting thing is, and this is kind of the theme that if nothing else I want you to take away, is that obviously I'm gonna keep coming back to, we don't just look at return, we look at volatility. Volatility really speaks to risk. So if you look at the JSE's top 40 at that um, 0.73 annualized return versus a volatility of 12.55, and you look at SA credit at 9.55 versus a volatility of 0.36, it's a no brainer. And you might have heard on financial shows or whatever, when people speak of this risk adjusted return um, concept. And so we are getting from a diversified credit basis, a much higher return for relatively lower risk. Whereas if I put all my money in the top 40 index, I would get a much lower return, but for infinitely lower, I mean, for infinitely higher risk, et cetera. You know? And it's a key concept and an approach as a financial manager um, in deciding whether something should come into play or whether you're going to spend time and money on something as well. And this graph just really uh, confirms that. It, um, speaks to the previous slide as well. So, you know, it's a, it's a very key thing, uh, as I said, if nothing else that you would walk away here, is that don't ever, and you know, you can distill it to almost anything in your life, not just uh, within a fancy, um, formalized financial services discussion, but you know, this risk adjusted return, am I getting the relevant reward relative to the risk that I'm exposing myself to? So it's a key concept. Um, it, I think what is happening, as I've discussed, is that uh, it's not just um, for a variety of reasons. It's an essay that this, the private debt is establishing itself as a as a class here. In South Africa, it's it's easy. You know, we've got a very sophisticated financial services market, um, very strong regulatory environment. Um, which helps in establishing not just private debt as an asset class, but certainly reaffirming other asset classes and sort of their continuing existence as well. You know? 
And that what we've got though as a constraint is that because it's growing, it's growing, but it's certainly not uh, big enough. So we traditionally lag the international market in this regard, as sophisticated as our offerings are. And those issues that I'm describing, lagging, etc. I mean, they're high, they are more present um, in the rest of Africa, certainly. You know. So even though the rest of Africa shows that um, there's a lot of opportunities, you know, they don't have necessarily our, our regulatory environment or I guess the depth of our capital markets and our pension funds and provident fund industries, et cetera. Um, but a key thing is that, you know, a lot of South African um, financiers and companies go into the rest of the continent with a view that uh, they can simply replicate what we've got here. But I think a key lesson for us that we've seen in other industries, not just financial services, is that there's no one size fits all approach. You've got to definitely um, look at the underlying environment. And, you know, Africa is not a country essentially. Uh, so Kenya, for instance, is, so in my previous job, I did quite a lot of uh, XSA. So um, Africa, other than South Africa, investment activity in the infrastructure space and no two countries are the same. So you've got to tailor the approach, but obviously you're remaining true to sort of fundamental principles, first principles as well. Um, I think I've covered this. Um, so look, I think I'm gonna just round off essentially is that, um, so yeah, I'm gonna round off by saying, look, you know, an allocation to private debt, you know, is is a compelling one and if nothing else that slide that i put up around risk adjusted return uh, of nine and a half 9.6 relative to very low volatility is as a selling thing even before i make a comparison just on its own that should be a compelling enough uh, narrative for investors certainly and you know private debt falls within a broader discussion around what they call alternative investments and that in itself is kind of a growing theme and it's not it's not homogenous so we can't really say alternative investments is it's my view that you can't really say it's an asset class on its own because within that you've got infrastructure excuse me you've got infrastructure private debt or private equity and so on as well. But uh, anyway, the focus on alternative investments is growing. And alternative investments really means um, your non-traditional stuff like uh, listed equities, bonds, and fixed income. And private debt's also gonna play quite a key role in my view, in within a certain context, in reframing this post-COVID reality. Um, so you guys would have seen that uh, the infrastructure office and the presidency announced some projects that they looking to get funded. So the South African fiscus doesn't have um, money, you know, we're not putting it simply, but maybe truthfully, we don't have money. So what's going to have to happen is, so when the South African government doesn't have money, it's traditionally tapped into your bond market. So that bond market is also stretched. So the next frontier is certainly the private debt market. And, uh, I think just to round off, you know, investing for me is, especially in a country like South Africa, where these issues are so topical. So the idea of economics, investments, I think form a core part of the national discourse and the world for the foreseeable. And, you know, for those of you who have an interest in it, the, there are many ways to come to it. As I said, I, can, I mean, you can see from the brief description that I gave my, I have a non, a very sort of non-traditional academic background, 
Um, so, you know, it's mostly dominated, I would say, by uh, CFAs and, and or CAs, um, or people with kind of a, a finance and investment undergrad. Um, and, you know, I think South Africa is unique in that regard, because if you look at the academic parts, path to banking, financial services generally overseas, um, you get a plethora of uh, historians, uh, engineers for sure, lawyers, um, people with history and literature degrees um, coming in. And I guess my own philosophical take has always been that I think a, a degree or whatever you study teaches you how to process mass information you know, um, of all types. So I think, I guess the point is that uh, if you are an engineering student or even an English lit student, but with the capacity for numbers and these type of things, it, you shouldn't restrict yourself as well. And yeah, I think it's important that um, we also, which I didn't touch on as I spoke, um, but we also remember that uh, the differences in, I think, backgrounds should strengthen our approach. And I think there's been a very traditional but narrow um, approach to how we define investments in this country. That's changing now as we're seeing more people speak of impact investments where there's, a, there's no tension between um, doing good and making money, you know, which hasn't been the South African experience. Um, but I think how that's going to be strengthened is if you don't simply have um, accountants and even lawyers for that matter running the shop, you know. So just kind of feeding the tree um, through different avenues would, would benefit us, you know. And, you know, we're excited that hopefully out of such engagements, we plant some seeds in some of you and we'll be hearing from you, you know, because we've got quite an exciting graduate program which has bled in, um, I guess, very different backgrounds uh, and where people have come through that grad program. In fact, I think a good example is the head of fixed income um, at Stanley, which is one of the largest uh, and best performing, actually, fixed income houses in the country. Uh, you know, he started out, I think could be corrected here, Rosa, but he started out through the grad program, you know, a guy called uh, a Chuck from Limpopo, Victor Pathudi, and he, you know, has grown through it, and uh, and there's other examples of that as well, you know, so it's an organization that takes the, this, that takes this type of engagement quite seriously. And I think I'll pause there. And, and thank you very much for letting us have the time to, to present to you and uh, bomb you with jargon and, uh, and I guess words that some, for some of you might not be familiar, but I hope I distilled it enough. Thank you. Um, I don't know if there's questions, I can look at the chat, uh, but maybe you might want to drive it for me. Um, uh, some of the questions. Um, thank you, Kolo Fellow, for that informative session. There are a few questions. Um, the first question is from Lisa. So Lisa is asking you for the investment split. Um, she says that she's not sure if she jotted it down correctly. Okay. The investment split. Um, I think I'm not sure if I'm answering it right, but the investment split maybe when I was referring to is when we're thinking about what we refer to as allocation, portfolio allocation. Um, we make certain decisions because we've got, we don't have an, an infinite pool of resources. So we make certain trade-offs between where we'll allocate money. 
And those allocation decisions are, are made, are really informed by what outcomes we, we want. And there's often not really, it's not a hard right or wrong um, approach. I mean, you can make very wrong allocation decisions, but it's not really, the framing of it is not really right or wrong or specified guidelines. So the way I like to explain it, for example, which I hope makes sense, is that even as an individual, when you start working, you'll see you'll get into a provident and, and or pension fund. Um, when you're young, the allocation split, so this, they'll come to you with a form and say, listen, I'm going to take 15, 20,000 rands of your salary every month. Um, and we put it into a pension fund, for instance. And then there's a form where you decide that allocation split. So that allocation split would be say, you say to that investment advisor that I want 50% of it in equities, I want 30% of it in bonds, and then I want 20% of it in private debt. And what will inform that, it'll look very different from the 22, 23, 24 year old um, new job market entrant to say the 50 to 55 year old. You know? And why it will look different is because you've got different needs. You know? So at 55, 50 years, you know, you're looking at retirement, you're looking at capital preservation, so you're looking at less risky um, allocation decisions. And so you likely to have maybe a higher bond allocation just for, or higher fixed income allocation because you want um, you know, regular income coming into your portfolio. But if you're young, you can literally ride out the volatility. So you might say, no, look, I don't want to have a high fixed income allocation. I want to have uh, exposure to equity markets. You know? And... Um, you'll change that as you, as you go along. So your, your split is really informed by, and a company split as well, uh, around how they allocate resources, be it if it's a capital uh, structure uh, discussion or just generally a resource allocation discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Kaye Lise. Um, do you think that warehouses and logistics companies will benefit from the increase in online sales, given that more companies will need storage? Yeah, the short answer is definitely, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, the short answer is definitely. And then the next question is from Tope. Um, how do we participate in private debt? As, as a individual, there aren't, unfortunately, many retail offerings that are available. But I think, I don't think, I know that's changing. So I'm on a working group uh, subcommittee that's looking at exactly this for retail um, across various private debt instruments. So there's an industry body called ASISA. Um, which is basically the savings, institutional savings industry body, um, which we are a member of. And I'm on the CISA, me and I think six other people are on that working group committee to look at ways in which we can introduce re a retail component into private debt across the spectrum, infra, uh, real estate, etc. Okay, um, thank you. Um, the next question is from Tope. How do you compare with Old Mutual and other portfolio management? Does Stanley trade Forex? How do you engage students? Um, yeah, how we compare with Old Mutual, similar, especially given that um, they're also part of a large insurance, banking insurance, uh, universe so they own so the hold calls own there's an insurance um, component there's a banking component through netbank and there's an investment services excuse me through you know more traditional old mutual so standard within the liberties 
Standard Bank ecosystem is quite similar. In terms of private debt, we've got a similar focus to, to them. Um, and, you know, Old Mutual's got different branches of this. So Future Growth is an Old Mutual company, which I think we more similar picked to. And we, from a private debt perspective, um, future growth in an all-in um, asset under management is larger, but they've got quite a big um, fixed income component in there. But from a private debt perspective, we are probably comparable in terms of size. And um, the other entities that do private debt is Sunlam through the Sunlam Capital Markets uh, division as well, uh, smaller than us in, in some respects, also just from a private debt perspective, but they've also been around the block. Uh, so <clears throat> I think between the three of us in the main, there's some others which, which are coming up, but between the three of us in the main, we offer the largest uh, institutional debt uh, offerings in the market here, yeah, in, in private debt. And how we engage with students, uh, I mentioned that there is a grad program. It's good that we've made contact with you. Um, I would, if there's interest where people are at the end of their career and show high proficiency in their studies and so on as well, um, I'll speak to Mukobe and I'll put you guys in touch with uh, the relevant HR people for sure. It would be good to sort of get this type of engagement going yeah. um okay our next question is from okay unknown is there a way for retail investors to participate in the private debt market what are the resources that one can read to understand the quality of the private debt property product sorry product mm -hmm. yes yeah, so there's lots of resources and what i'll commit to doing um, is that uh, i'll put a small reading list together and I will send it through to Mugome and you can disseminate to, to, your, to your members. But there's lots of uh, interesting uh, reading. But I would also suggest that if you're interested in, in private debt finance, uh, I'd read very broadly. Uh, so read, I, I read, and even as a student, I always read, um, things like the economist which and you've got to read kind of across the ideological spectrum so the economist i would read local stuff like financial mail business day even though a lot of them are behind paywalls there's still some valuable stuff that's free and uh financial times wall street journal but read broadly as well you know so you need to understand kind of I think broader political economy considerations. So I think to be a really good portfolio manager at the end of the day, you're not just um, existing in a silo around finance and, and so on as well. Um, okay, um, Tope is asking, is your savings free also an investment in private debt? So you, you have some savings free um, products I've seen one actually, which underpins itself with uh, with private debt. Um, so savings free, you for those who don't know, is that stuff that where you get sort of a tax break or a tax write off essentially. But what what is uh, what's at the back end of that differs. So some of them simply go towards government or treasury retail funds and then they've got a small component of other things like private debt. You know. um, but that's a very vanilla instrument where you give, you basically lending money, um, I mean they differ, so it's just one where you're lending money to to, uh, I guess, mostly treasury retail funds underpins. Um, and then government then uses that money for specific purposes as well. Um, okay. 
Um, there's another question. Does Stanlib trade Forex? Um, the, yeah, I think there's Stanlib covers across the spectrum. So there are elements, especially within the market manager space, where people would trade Forex, um, even if it's not for its own purposes. You know, so I know there's a lot of these Forex traders um, on social media and so on as well. Uh, without giving a view on them. So typically you would get people trading forex in inverted commas within an within the SA institutional space as a risk um, management mechanism. So if I've got dollar exposure on an underlying portfolio and I want to hedge it out essentially. So that I guess would fit the definition of uh, trading forex. forex. So not, not in the same way that you see like on Instagram, these uh, binary, uh, you know, it's usually, yeah, these guys with cars and stuff. So uh, uh, not in that manner, yeah. Um, okay. I don't think Unknown heard you correctly because you said you'll put together a reading list, right? A small reading list, yeah. Because he's asking, is asking if are there any book recommendations for starters into the private debt market just for grabbing just for grabbing key concepts and what drives the private debt market yeah 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 there, there certainly are so i'll put like a very brief um uh, recommended list of articles and books and then i'll send that out um okay please don't forget to add the COVID 19 article as well yes i will i won't yeah i won't Definitely. I want. All right. Thank you so much, Kolo Fellow, for being with us today. We really appreciate it at History Makers. Yeah, no, thank and, you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Okay, and thank you to everybody else for joining us this morning. Have a great day and stay safe. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.